Good afternoon. Thank you. We're, we're awake. That's good. We want to welcome you to the 40th Color Lab Convention. We're in Cary, North Carolina, and today is Tuesday, March 26th. This is the uh, session, intro session on effective teaching. Um, my name is Jerry Reed. Uh, Dell and I live in Rockledge, Florida. I've been calling for a little over 30 years and have been a member since uh, uh, 1983. Um, I believe teaching is very important and should be fun for both the instructor and the students. Uh, I believe this is true no matter what subject is being taught and as it relates to square dancing, no matter which program we're teaching. On the panel with us today, with us, with me, <laughs> is Dottie Welsh. Uh, Dottie is from uh, near Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia in, Can uh, in Canada. Uh, she was a math teacher for 25 years, junior high through uh, the university teaching. Uh, Dottie has been calling for 30 years and calls for beginners through uh, challenge and contra. Dottie joined Color Lab in 1995. Dottie has been chairman of the Choreographic Applications Committee since 2004. Uh, please welcome Dottie. Dottie and I have uh, conducted this session for at least twice. Is this our twice or our third time? Twice? Third time. Third time. And we enjoy it each time because we both believe that teaching is extremely important and believe it should be not only fun, but done effectively, and that is our goal today. Uh, we will be presenting um, some information. The information that we provide, uh, that we'll be uh, giving you, um, will be uh, compatible with each of our presentations. We will present that information in a slightly different form, and I think that's good because we get uh, uh, you'll get a different perspective of the same information. And the handouts that uh, Dottie and I have, we have copies here. We also got them in time to the home office that they are on the uh, the CD that you received. At least we were told that they were on. I haven't actually looked at the CD, so. I have to assume that they are. Um, if I had to give one word to describe effective teaching, before I give you that one word, I will let you know that the, when, when I do presentations, unless I have a, like a wireless mic, I usually sit down and, and do that. Dottie stands up. So... <laughs> So don't be surprised when she does that. <laughs> it surprised me. But uh, that's a, it's, and again, it's a different approach to providing the same information. Uh, if I had to describe effective teaching in one word, that one word would be preparation. And attending this session certainly be, uh, shows us and yourselves that you have taken that step toward preparation is to be here. Um, and I believe that to be an effective teacher, you must be prepared. Uh, and as, as I've said, you have started that process by being at, the, at this session or uh, buying and listening uh, to the audio. Um, we are being recorded, so if you have a question, make sure that we do get the microphone to you so we get that question on the audio. Unfortunately, we only have one wireless mic, so it'll, it, we'll just have to get that microphone to you. Um, some of the other steps that I believe are important uh, uh, to be prepared, to get prepared, to become an effective teacher is to make a lesson plan. I believe it's important to make a lesson plan for the whole season that you're going to be teaching. And again, it does not matter which program you're teaching. Uh, I believe it's important to make a lesson plan for each session. 
Uh, if you are anything like me, the, the plan that you put together for that session, in most cases, will change. Either you will go faster, things just roll quicker than you expect them to, or things are going to really slow down. You'll just have to review more than you think you might have to. And, but be flexible. But I, mean, I think it's important. I know it's important to have a lesson plan. Again, be, be prepared to modify that plan. I believe it's important for you to review the list of whatever program you're teaching. I believe also it's important to review, read, and know the definitions. Many instructors simply teach the way that they were taught. So they kind of remember back when they were being taught this particular move and remember how that, that uh, instructor instructed them, and they just repeat that or modify that, those, those words. Um, as we know, definitions sometimes change, and I believe it's important to review those definitions uh, before we actually uh, take up the job of teaching them. Um, I believe also that it's important to provide what may seem to some of us as too much practice. There certainly is a time when there's too much practice, but I think I, in my experience, it has been that I get to a point where I believe we've had too much practice long before the, the class people get to that feeling. So uh, I am a, am a believer that practice, 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 practice is the way that people learn to square dance correctly. Watch for mistakes, and as soon as you see a mistake, correct it. Um, I, there are some teachers who do not... Um, encourage angels. I do encourage angels. However, I like to uh, caution them to not push, shove, turn around uh, the people as we go through the calls because if I'm watching square A and over here, square B, people are getting pushed in the correct position, I come back and I check on square B. They're in the correct position. I don't know whether they got there on their own or whether they were uh, helped into that position. I ask the angels to maybe point to where people should be, a gentle reminder that way. Unlearning a call is much more difficult than the initial learning. I'm not sure what the time frame is to unlearn a call and then reteach it, but I do know that unlearning and then learning the correct way is very time-consuming. I believe that using choreography, which in involves uh, all the dancers, when possible, is important. Uh, how many of you attended Barry's session this morning on Dance by Definition? Okay. In, in that... In that um, uh, Referent, or in that, that session, he talked about int introducing it the smallest number of people, say uh, a dos a do only requires two people, uh, and I believe that also, a star through also, with the two people, a, a star through, I will, I will teach um, everybody in a big circle, I demonstrate it in the middle, and then I have everybody do the star through on the outside, so they're working with, with just two people. And when uh, I believe that they have mastered that, then involve more and more people so that they can see how that particular that particular call is used in, uh, in uh, other uh, applications. If you feel it's uh, helpful, use demonstrations to show moves which may be difficult uh, to uh, explain. Some of the ones that I use uh, demos for are uh, star through, uh, California twirl. I believe also that it's important to keep the music playing 
while you are talking, explaining, walk, talking through uh, each particular call. The music would be very, very low, certainly not to inter interfere to with, with what you're, with your speaking. But I believe hearing the music all the time is important to kind of get that feel of the music as they're, as they're learning. Um, if you don't feel comfortable with that, certainly don't do it. But keep the volume very, very low, so it's really background information, uh, background noise. I believe it's important to dance more than stand. I believe that uh, explaining uh, calls, describing calls, should be uh, as concise as possible to uh, provide the information uh, required so that they understand uh, what is going to be required of them as they uh, are called upon to, to perform whatever calls it is that we're, we're teaching. There are many, many teaching aids that are available on the Color Lab website. Um, and among those are, not that one, that says guidelines for committee chairman, but that probably wouldn't help much. Uh, the standard applications books, how many of you are aware that there are standard applications books? A little disappointing, <laughs> but uh, uh, Dowdy's committee, the choreographic applications committee, is responsible for maintaining <coughs> two documents, standard mainstream, basic mainstream uh, applications, and also standard plus applications. I believe it, it behooves us as instructors to be aware of what those standard applications are. Those are the applications which are, are the dancers are exposed to most often. There's nothing in there that says you can't call anything that's not in there it says if you if you are going to call, uh, these are the, the applications which will be most successful. There's also on the Color Lab uh, teaching tips for mainstream, teaching tips for plus. There's a document called teaching techniques. Uh, and I would encourage each of you to uh, go to the Color Lab website and download those documents and take a look at them. Um, that's the basic information that I have at this time. Uh, I know Dottie has a wealth of information to uh, present as well. And I think what I will do is ask Dottie to make her presentation now, and we may or may not have demo uh, get you up and, and do some practice things or show you some of the things that we do. And after Dottie is done, uh, then I may have some additional information uh, for you also. Are there any questions or comments about any of the things that we've covered so far? Good. That means one of two things. I've covered the subject very thoroughly. Actually, three things. I've covered the subject very thoroughly. You're thoroughly confused and have no idea what to ask. You're asleep. So, <laughs> but uh, if you do have questions as they come up, certainly do uh, let us know. How about a nice welcome again for Dottie? All right, so I suspect that all of you are suffering from the I'm asleep <laughs> syndrome at this point because I certainly feel that it's after lunch, and it's for me it's the fourth day of Collar Lab stuff, and I've been going flat out and concentrating hard all this time, and I'm beginning to you know, hit that wall. But uh, hopefully we'll uh, – and nudge me if I forget to do this because I think you're going to need this sometime in this – time, I'm going to ask you to stand up and stretch so that you don't completely sink into the chair. All right. So please look first at the handout that I gave you called Learning Styles for Dancing. <laughs> All right. There's three handouts. I thought maybe I could wait till the end, but uh, guess not. Sorry about that, teacher. That's all right. <laughs> that was good 
exercise. You suddenly woke up now, right? Actually. <laughs> All right. So, although this says effective teaching, one of the things that we have to think about as teachers is how to reach you as learners. And that means we need to know something about how you learn. Out there in the world, there are several various kinds of theories about how people learn. And you may say, oh, well, does that mean that there's disagreement? No, it doesn't really mean there's disagreement. What it means is that people have studied various and sundry aspects of the learning process and come up with theories about those various and sundry aspects, some of which apply very much to square dance teaching and some of which only apply a little bit to square dance teaching. And if you were at the session that Barry did this morning, he added to that mix yet one more variation of the ways to think about how people learn and, and what happens inside. And that's all part of a bigger picture. My experience goes way, way back to before most of these theories were really developed. So I've kind of learned about them in the course of my teaching experience. Some of them have really resonated and those are the ones that I'm going to share with you today. Some of them I will just briefly touch on because they're out there and you may hear about them and they have some relevance to other aspects of what goes on in the square dance world but perhaps aren't directly af affecting what you do when you're teaching somebody to square through out there. Okay, so on the very first thing I have on this page is types of motivation. You know, we really need to be motivated in order to do something. So what motivates people? Well, one person's theory is that there's three basic types of motivation. Those who wish to achieve something. They have some goal in mind. They think, oh, I'd love to be a plus dancer, therefore I'm going to work my way through this and get there because it's something I'd like to do. There's those who are motivated by power because they think if they do something that that will give them more power. Now, as callers, we have to admit that amongst ourselves, that may be a big motivator. That the feeling of being up here and in charge is one of the reasons you do this. Yes, maybe. It's for some, more than for others, but certainly it's out there. And then those, there are those who are motivated for social reasons, that they want to have some social recognition, not necessarily power, but just that they know more people, they're friends with more people, that they have a, a larger group of people that are, they feel like they're family, part of their life, and so forth. So ask yourself, now nobody falls in only one of these categories, but ask yourself, how am I motivated? What do I view as important? What are my motivational goals here? And if your motivational goal is significantly different from someone else's motivational goal, then you will realize that in order to understand what's going on in your relationship to that person, perhaps you need to step back and say, well, this is my goal and that's their goal. And no wonder we're kind of going in different directions because you are in fact going in different directions. So that's something to keep in mind. What's your motivation and what is somebody else's motivation? Then we have the Gregorch model of learning styles. Now, a lot of these call things learning styles, and they are learning styles. It's hard to keep them separated. But this one has to do with perception and how you absorb what you perceive. So in the perception category, we have the concrete and the abstract. Someone is concrete, a concrete perception person if their mind is most comfortable registering information through their senses. The abstract person's mind is more comfortable using the intellect to think of ideas and intuition and imagination rather than directly what they see. Quite different. And again, in all of these things, you probably aren't entirely one or entirely the other, but you may tend towards one or tend towards the other. So think about yourself, because I'm going to ask in a minute, am I concrete or am I abstract? Ordering, sequentially or randomly. 
Sequential mind prefers to organize in a linear step-by-step -step way. Random mind prefers to organize by chunks. Okay, little story. I was working with a friend at Square Dance World on creating uh, the kind of, uh, what do we call it, the souvenir booklet for a convention. Okay, so what should we put in there? We kind of began to make a tentative list and get, gather some stuff. And we obviously, I'm the sequential person, and she was the random person. She's gathered this stuff that there's no order. No order. She's got personal advertisements mixed with tourist information, mixed with square dance program, mixed with, you know, and I'm looking at it. Rita, can we please reorganize this? I can't. She's saying, well, it doesn't matter. I said, well, it may not matter to you, but it matters to me, and you won't care if I have it in my order, so can we please put it in my order? <laughs> okay, so example of two minds that had really different kinds of, and my knowing that somebody might think of it a different way let me say, okay, it doesn't matter to you, but it matters to me, so does it, is that okay? So... Now we put these two things together. So we have people who are concrete sequential. They think, sight, smell, touch, taste, and hearing, and they want it in linear step-by-step -step order. So they want facts, they work step-by-step, -step. they pay attention to details, they prefer having a schedule, and so forth. Concrete random, they want to test for themselves, solve problems creatively, learn only what is necessary, and just kind of work in a general time frame, use insight and instinct. Abstract sequential, they want exact, correct information, gather their data, and then they decide. Know the source of facts. They want sufficient time to do a proper job. They don't want to have to do it in a rush. Want an opportunity for analysis. Organized filer of information. And there's the fourth one, abstract random. Want broad general principles, decide with, a, decide with a heart, ask for advice, unstructured, consider others' feelings, spontaneous. Okay. Who's concrete sequential? There's nothing right or wrong about any of these. So who thinks they're concrete, or, concrete sequential thinkers? Okay, we've got one over there. What? Okay, which of these resonated with you? Which of those characteristics? Everything in order, attention to details. Okay, do you, do you get... You, yeah. Here we go, yes, he needs a coffee, yes, he does. Okay, okay, it, facts and attention to details. Who's concrete random? All right, Aaron, and why? All right, I think I need to get this down here so you guys can see. Okay, so can I just go back here a second? So, first one. Sharon, comp concrete, sequential, want the facts, have everything in order, pay attention to details, routine. Um, Aaron Byers from California. I'm a concrete random. Um, I like to find out things for myself. Um, I. I like to work in a general time frame. I don't like to be too constricted by time. Um, I like to act on the spur of the moment, and I don't mind frequent changes in environment. Who's abstract sequential? Abstract sequential. Who falls in that category? Okay, Michael. <laughs> Michael Maltford. I'm not sure I've got much to add to your list. Most of them seem to make a lot of sense to me, uh, gathering data and then deciding logical reasoning. Okay, and, I, and I will just toss in that I fall in that category too, organized filer of information. <laughs> okay, but what does that say? I'll come to the last one, but what does that say? First of all, that says that the three of us think in one kind of way, and if we have to work with people that think in a different kind of way or teach people that think in a different kind of way, we have to keep in mind that what works for us does not necessarily work for them. Okay, what about abstract random? Okay. 
Michael Fetting with Andrew, North Carolina, Andrew Twirlers. Um, I like to listen to the overall thing, but decide with my heart what where to go. And uh, I don't like to take um, and walk over people. I try to listen to what they're doing, and if I see it and I feel like I'm going to offend somebody, that really bothers me. So I, uh, I always ask for advice. Uh, I don't pretend I know everything. I do like the free-flowing, and I do feel like I'm spontaneous. <laughs> All right. Anybody else like to have their say at this point? Yeah. Uh, I'm Barry Clasper from uh, Toronto, and I've decided I'm an abstractly concrete mess <laughs> because, like, I can pick bits and pieces out of all of those that, you know, like I, I like facts and I work step by step, but I don't like details. They're just too much work. I like abstract, you know, uh, general principles. and So uh, I'm not sure. I fit in the middle of the page somewhere. Okay. And, in fact... As I said before, there's going to be people that are on the extreme end of concrete and on the extreme end of abstract and others that are somewhere in the middle. And the same thing works for the other one. So if you like, if you're kind of in between on both, then yes, you are going to land right in the middle of the page. And that too needs to be remembered, that these are kind of the extreme ends, but there are middles, there's middle road. And I'm probably going to be stealing what you're about ready to say, but one of the things that we had to do at our work area is go through the spectrum. And the whole fact of the matter is, is you're working with different people. And when you're teaching, you've got to take all that into consideration. So that's exactly the point. People are different. They think about things differently. They, they comprehend and want to order and seek their sequence of wishing to do things is different, and especially when you're working both trying to achieve some goal, that can become a factor, and it's really helpful to understand that they may just be on a different, little bit different road than you are, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a different thing and needs to be recognized. Okay, so second page, learning styles for remembering information. And this one to me, is the one that is most important of the things that I'm listing here in terms of helping square dancers learn to square dance. We basically have three here. and I've had several people say to me there's actually a fourth, and I won't debate that there's not, uh, and I'll point that out when we get here. But this um, study that I'm discussing here, and by the way, the the references at the end, a book called The Way They Learn is, is listed at the end of the page. We have, they say, among the population, 65% of us are visual learners who primarily gather information by sight. And if you're talking to them, they would tend to say, because it's the way their mind functions, I see what you're saying, or I see what you're doing. They take detailed notes, they learn from diagrams and pictures and written information, and they like to read from themselves rather than be read to. Okay, how many think you fall in the visual category? So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe a nine out of 19. So we're not quite 50%, but that's not bad. And I fall in that category, so that adds another one here. <laughs> I don't know about Jerry. Okay. Auditory learners, 30% of the population, primarily gather information by hearing, tend to say, I hear how to do it, listen first and take notes after, if at all, or rely on printed notes, learn well from the spoken word, and tend to look up or down or close their eyes when trying to absorb information because they're shutting out the visual environment as they think about it. Okay, auditory learners. How many? One. There's another maybe. <laughs> two. Half, half, okay. One, two, three, four, five. So that kind of reflects the same kind of percentage that they're telling us here. 
Now, by the way, let me just stop and back up a minute here. We've got visual learners and auditory learners. And here's a symptom that I'm well aware of as I go to this kind of an event. I'm a visual learner. I want to read for myself. I learn by looking at something. Notice that I handed out the handout and I'm having you look at it because that's what I prefer. My philosophy is the auditory learner who perhaps doesn't take notes and doesn't care whether they see this until later, well, if you don't want to look at it while I'm talking about it, that's your business. But I'm going to put it out there because I know that some people are going to be very unhappy if they don't have it in their hand. So that's the compromise here. Uh, it's fine with me. If it's not helping you very much, then, then okay, maybe it's a few pennies of <laughs> copying here, but that's the only de drawback. Then we come to the third ones, the kinesthetic or tactile learners. Only 5% of the population primarily gather information through touch and movement, tend to say, I feel how this goes, tend to watch the teacher very closely. That was the first symptom that I noticed of somebody that was truly a tactile learner in one of my math classes years ago. They sat in the front row, and their eyes were glued to me all the time. And I thought, what, what's going on here? Do I have a spot on my nose or, you know, what, what, always, day after day, eyes glued to me. Good student, no problems, but wasn't exactly a behavior that I expected. Well, now I understand. This was a tactile learner, and that was the way they learned. They're conscious. They wanted to be focused on the teacher. And the focus was intense and strong need a self-determined learning environment, usually involving action, exceptionally good at learning skills by imitation and practice. They need physical information. They want to know what it feels like to do something. And, and for our square dance world, this is a critical factor since each different formation and position feels different, even the fact that they're doing the same thing but the square has been rotated and now they're facing this wall instead of that wall. For a tac true tactile learner, that's a whole new world. As a caller, you need to be aware of that. You need to be aware that in order for them to properly learn something that you're going to call facing any one of those walls at some time or another, they have to have a chance to experience that during the learning process. Or they will find themselves facing this wall, which they've never seen before, and think, I can't do that call from here, where somebody that learns differently and has absorbed it in a different way and doesn't even think about the walls, only thinks about, well, I'm in the square facing out, and therefore I do this and so, is fine. major eye-opener if you have never considered that fact. Okay, kinesthetic learners, how many have we got? That would be you, okay. Yeah. And Nancy. Yeah. And Jerry. Okay, so Jerry, maybe at this point you'd like to have a word or two about this. Well, I think, uh, I don't think I know uh, those uh, characteristics. Uh, I fit a lot of them, although I will say there are a couple out of the other two that also. Yeah. Yeah. As, as before, there's going to be crossover. Barry Glassberg again. I'd just like this to say that because of the nature of our activity, and, and it is a dance activity involving motion, that has the effect of biasing upwards the percentage of people who are getting their a, a major part of their information through kinesthetic or tactile channels. Because even people that their primary learning mode or preferred learning mode might be one of the others, because what you're doing is a physical thing, it all makes it much more important to them than it would normally be. Yep. 
yes, I agree uh, what, with what Barry said um, because what we do is, I mean, the only way to, to learn square dancing is to actually do it. Um, my, my feeling on that would be that that's true when, we, when we're teaching these people. As instructors, we need to recognize that there are some people out there who that's not their primary learning um, mode. So we need to be able to um, fill, their, or, uh, fill their needs uh, if they're one of the other two kind of, of learners. So what does that tell us? First of all, for the situation where you've got a big hall and they cannot see all the way across, so it's hard for you to do a demonstration in the front, and really they're dependent upon hearing what you say, if that's the only piece of transfer of information, the mere fact that you're, say, quoting the definition or whatever, and they're, if they're an auditory learner, that's not too bad, but that's only 30% of your dancers. Okay? So that means that y you have to help them find a way to translate what you are able to do into what they need, which for a visual learner is you need to give them a picture. If you can't actually let them see the picture but can mentally describe the picture, that will help. Yep. So you would, this is Mike Callahan from New York, you'd probably say that the tactile learners probably need more walkthroughs, physical walkthroughs, than just demonstrations that they're watching maybe. Physical walkthroughs for sure. And not just more physical walkthroughs, but more opportunities to dance one position. I mean, this became really obvious to me when I had a tactile learner who was trying to, struggling, and believe me, really struggling, to learn cast a shadow. Why did cast a shadow give him such a bad time? I was calling it only from the positions with the girls on the ends and the boys in the middle of parallel waves or lines. Now think about that. Okay, I wasn't making him do the end outside part. I was only making him do the middle. But even though he was doing the middle, he was still faced with starting in waves, starting in two-faced lines, starting in a right-handed wave, starting in a left-handed wave, or a right-handed or left-handed two-faced line. And for the tactile learner, when you add in all the fact that he could have been facing any one of the four walls, his mind was just being blown by way too many different applications. And not until I clued into the fact of what was really going on and that, that I had to address that and said, okay, back to square one. We're going to call cast a shadow from only one position facing one wall until he's comfortable with that. And then we'll gradually add other things. Now, that doesn't mean that I went back to the complete walkthrough but that I made a point in my own mind of tracking him for a while and saying, okay, which way is he facing? You've got to stick with that until he's comfortable with that and then move on to the next one. And after I did that, he learned it. He had it. I think another uh, aspect, maybe the flip side of this coin, is that kinesthetic learners are getting additional cues from the movement that other people may not be, um, you know, uh, sensitive to. And uh, I noticed this when I was trying to teach square through. And I couldn't understand why some people, particularly usually the boys, would turn the wrong way on, on the second hand until it dawned on me that for a boy, the first hand is a right pull by and they're turning to their right. The second hand is a left pull by and you want them to turn to their right, but they just use their left hand, so they turn out, and now they're confused. And, and it took a while for it to dawn on, dawn on me that that was a, a miscue for the boys, because I, I couldn't understand why the girls weren't doing it, but that's because their first hand was, uh, was already wrong for them, so they were already cued, clued in to sort of pay attention to which way they were facing. Yeah. So... There's no denying the fact that the visual learner needs to have the physical practice. 
this is a physical activity. You need to feel how the call goes. But I think for some of us, I know I talk to dancers and say, okay, what have you got in your mind about this? Can you quote the definition? Some can, some can't. The ones that can't, though, have developed this feeling for what this call does, and they dance by that feeling. They, well, it's the one that goes this way and then this way. They can't tell me what they're doing, but they know what they're doing. They know what it feels like. They have a sense of how many beats of music it takes, how many steps they have to do it. They've developed that over time. As Barry would have said this morning, that's their definition of that call. Okay? Anything else about these three? Now, the, what do you think the fourth one is that some people classify? Well, that's an interesting one. Okay, that wasn't what I was expecting. She said, people who learn by teaching other people. This is Aaron Byers again. There is a very, very small percentage of people who cannot learn something unless they teach it to somebody else. My analysis of that would be what I, something I was going to say later, that someone who is good at translating something from one format of incoming information to the format that they need to have it in makes the effort to translate from what's coming in to what's going to be necessary for them to be able to achieve whatever it is. So for that kind of person, the process of teaching somebody else forces them to make that translation, to absorb, okay, now how do I describe that to somebody else? Well, they're going to describe it in a term that makes sense to them. And, and figuring that out teaches it to themselves. So that's, okay. I was going to say, people learn by reading, period. How many people in this room have learned it sing some part of your score dancing by sitting and reading the book? So we all do that at some level. We all do that at some level. You can claim that's visual, but it is and it isn't. It's a visual. It's something that's coming in through the eyes, yes, but you're not really seeing it happen. You're, you're reading a description and... and doing it in your head to understand. So that's kind of a different process. All right. Then we have another model of approaches to understanding this time. And we divide people into two categories here, those who are analytic and those who are global. And this is another thing that applies to teach directly to teaching square dancing, and it's something that I only really clued into in fairly recent time. And that is, first of all, we have the analytic person who focuses on detail, prefers learning alone, needs neatness to concentrate, ignores distractions, dislikes interruptions, and works on one thing at a time, wants to be prepared, self-motivated, wants to evaluate quality, a way to evaluate it, wants to correct mistakes, and is logical and organized. And on the other side is focuses on the overall picture, cooperates in group efforts, functions amid clutter, easily distracted, tempted to procrastinate, does several things at once, flexible, goes with the flow, learns by discussion, avoids individual competition. Ooh, now that's interesting. Avoids individual competition, and we've got somebody else over here, wants a way to evaluate quality. Mm -hmm. Takes criticism personally, wants, the other side said, they want to know about their mistakes and they want them corrected. Hmm, what are you thinking to yourself? May skip steps and details. <laughs> okay, so you're looking at your class, and in short order, you better figure out who wants to be corrected and who does not. <laughs> Find a way to, to make sure that you can kind of make the correction without signals singling out anyone. That's critical here. Can you help the whole group get corrected and help somebody understand what went wrong without singling out whatever the cause was? So the other direct application is 
that at the beginning of teaching, a global learner will want to get a global picture. What's the big view here? And then they want some details to fill in that big picture. The analytic learner does not care about that global view at the beginning, only in a very minor way. They're interested in the details. Let's get to the story here. And then after they get to the bottom, they want some nice summary that summarizes it. So what does that say about what you need to do as a teacher? You need it at the beginning. OK, the analytic learner is going to say, I don't care, and tune out. So don't run on too long, because you'll lose them entirely. But it needs to be there. You do the careful teach. And then at the end, you summarize it again, at which point the global learner may not be paying attention. So again, don't run on too long. But it needs to be there at both parts, because you've got two different kinds of minds that you're dealing with. Okay. All right. On the last page, we've got some various and sundry other things that influence what's happening out there on the floor. I'm sure you're already aware of some of these. Sound needs to be good for square dancing, but some need things quiet. Others can deal with a lot of interference. And you know, for instance, right now we've got a bit more than you might like. Um, light, my husband, if the lights are too bright in the hall, he's back there flipping off half of them because he doesn't want it to be glaring. It's easier to function in a room that's not quite so bright, but, need, but he doesn't want it to be dark. It's just comfortable. Hot or cold certainly interferes with our concentration. If you're hungry or thirsty, same deal. Time of day. Who's a morning person? Who's an evening person? Uh, night. night. Midnight. <laughs> Who's the night owl? <laughs> All right. But if you're the night owl and you're trying to teach in the morning, you know that that's tough on you because you're not at your best. And if somebody's a morning person and you're trying to teach them at night, they're not at their best. Phases of the moon, oh yes. <laughs> Left-handed versus right-handed. How many lefties? OK, so tell us your experiences as a, as a dancer or as a teacher. How does that influence things? It doesn't. Partially, OK. What about down there? Doesn't bother you? I certainly have some dancers who really struggle when I switch from one to the other, if I'm doing right-handed things and then switch to left-handed things. For some, it's impossible. And for others, they say, oh, that was wonderful. It feels so good to go to the left. <laughs> so there's certainly an issue there. and. Uh, Who am I? Um, Aaron Byers. My husband, of course, I didn't know him when he learned how to square dance at six years old. But he told me he had a horrible time learning left from right because he's left-handed. And basically, he had to memorize when somebody said left, he had to memorize which way he was supposed to go. And he worked out some little tricks to help him remember right from left. And he claims it's because he's left-handed. Yeah, we ha I'm... We have a bias in our, definitely have a bias in our society towards right-handed things. And think about our square dance calls, especially for the men. How much of the time do you turn to your right? Supti Rogers from Cary. You know, thinking about what you just said, Aaron, I used to wear my class ring on my left hand for the longest time. And whenever I got confused, I'd think heavy and left. Yeah, yeah, it does make a difference. Male versus female, the, all, the whole society expectations issue. How does that influence how you do? Tall versus short, Special, especially short. What does the short lady see 
in the square. Way less than the tall guy. And I might point out as well, short caller, trying to learn to sight call, versus the tall guy. Big difference. Having an extra foot to stand up on when I was trying to learn to sight call. So I could see what was going on in the back half of the square made all the difference. Age differences. Oh, yes. And they're becoming more of an issue. But obviously we have to consider things like can they hear us? Can they see us? What is their energy level? How long should the tip go on because of their energy level? How long has it been since they've been in a learning environment? You know how fast students absorb like a sponge? Uh, what experiences are they bringing? Which might be a good thing. But you need to play to them. And active versus sedentary lifestyles, all the how energetic questions. So, successful teachers reach students by learning how they learn, observe what works, listen to the way a person communicates to get some clues, whether they say I see or I hear or I feel, experiment with various approaches. If one thing's not working, try another. Don't just repeat the first one. Maybe once in case something went astray, but try another. Focus on their strengths. Learn to recognize their learning styles. And the learners, as I already pointed out, they find a way, a good learner finds a way to translate into whatever form they need. All right, this is stretch moment. Anybody want to get up? Okay, time is moving on, so... The other sheet of paper that I did, the one that says uh, Effective Teaching Intercession with my name on it. Um, first of all, on, on one side here, I go down through much of the same kinds of things that Jerry was talking about. Uh, you'll notice preparation and some of the things that you need to be worrying about that he perhaps didn't mention, but I'm sure he knows about and agrees with. Consider the teaching order. If you're following along with Caller Labs, then you know that somebody has considered the teaching order and, and come to some conclusion about what it should be, and that's fine. That's, that's a way to consider. If you see some reason for modifying it, just think about it, and you might want to look at the document that talks about what's important for teaching orders. We attempt to maximize transfer aids and minimize sequential confusion. In other words, if a call will help the student learn another call that's going to come after. We make sure the first one is before and the second one is after and maybe a, a little bit apart if there's going to be any confusion between them. And we try not to put sequential calls that might be confusing just because one is being taught after the other. The classic example is right and left through followed by square through. What's the problem? They will do courtesy turns in the square through if you do one right after the other. So, and those kinds of things have been thought about in the teaching order. Um, analyze the call. He already said that. You need to know about the definition and all the related issues. And as well, you have to think about how do I set it up? How do I get them out quickly? And what are some good calls that come before and come after? Not just one, more than one, because you don't want to set into that system one that swing through was always followed by spin the top or that you can't do spin the top unless you've done swing through. <laughs> Lead right, veer left, circle to a line. So somebody calls lead right, do -so do where are they? <laughs> but they should be able to do that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Think about various ways to describe or demonstrate the action. Okay, the whole thing. So we're going to need, and I'm going to do an example here in a minute, but we're going to need something that appeals to the person that's visual something that appears to the person that's auditory, and something that appeals to the person that's kinesthetic. Okay. 
concentrate on one idea at a time and give them all the dancers equal practice opportunities. So what am I saying there? If Now, that doesn't mean that you have to put every dancer in every position that the call can be done from. But what it does mean is particularly if, for instance, think swing through. It begins with one of the boys facing in from a normal way, one of the boys facing out, same deal for the girls. And everybody should have a chance to do both of the two positions that you expect them to be able to do. Because sometimes, maybe inadvertently, because you weren't paying that close attention, you do them from one position over and over, and they've got that one down slick as a whistle, and then you go to the singing call and, and use it in the other position, and they're saying, but I didn't do this before. So you need to pay attention to that. If necessary, you need to write it out or just make sure that you use the figure for the sides and for the head so that everybody gets a, t a chance. Focus on the call being taught and avoid mixing in other new or difficult calls. They have one thing to concentrate on. Don't confuse them with others until they've got that one. And then plan a singing call figure which matches what you've been teaching so they get additional drill of the same kind. And you may not know exactly how far you're going to get in your teaching, so that means you need to have singing calls there waiting in your little stack of cards or whatever on your computer that are at each of the different possible stopping points at the end of your tip. Because you didn't know, know ahead of time usually exactly which one you're going to need. And then we have the presentation, warm-up time, non-invasive music, but keep it moving. And I like a major key so that everything feels positive and upbeat and a smooth rhythm. You need to project confidence. If there's difficulty, take the blame yourself. It was always something you said. Limit the teaching time, 10 minutes. Praise them with honest words. They will know if they've kind of messed it up, but you can almost always find something positive you can say. Use the call and the singing call, and then reteach, review. One of the very important things, I know Jerry's got it on here two or three times on his sheet, error-free practice, and preferably error-free right from the start. If we go back to what Barry was talking about this morning, system one, when you set that framework, you want it to be the right framework, the correct framework, because it's much harder to dismantle that framework and create a new one. Okay. Provide written descriptions and diagrams to anybody who's interested in having them. Point to internet animations if that helps them. But if somebody can't use those things and it's not useful to them, that's okay. Just remember, they learn in a different way, and you have to address that as well. Now, I have a whole list here at the bottom, awareness of cognitive limits. This comes from something that John Savalsky wrote. There's a, uh, the papers, I think, I know it's not hard to get. I'm not sure if it's on the Color Lab website or somewhere else, but it's but the uh, references at the bottom there, and and I know when I searched it, yeah. Okay, it's on Clark's website. Yeah, so I've done a very quick summary here at the bottom, but they, yep, yeah, sorry, okay. Uh, Clark Baker's website has a URL pointer to the to that document, and I I'm trying to remember which of my presentations I did. Uh, it's either the uh, uh, different but not destructive, or the dancing by definition presentation has that URL in the introductory paragraph, so you can get the information there. Thank you, Barry. So, bottom line, John's talking about the fact that. As dancers learn something, or as we learn anything, we start off with the system two that Barry talked about, which is when you are rationally thinking about every step of the process. And I can think I have a dancer who is a very 
much a system two person when he's learning something. So when he started to learn square through, it was almost painful to watch because it's thinking, what did she say? Okay, I have to do which foot? And he moves a foot. Okay, this hand, this hand. And I pull by, and then which way do I turn? And he slowly works his way through the whole thing. I mean, is he ever going to learn this? Well, yes, he did. But there was a long period between that very slow rational process and what we call chunking it into something that he could just dance and feel comfortable about doing it without struggling. That's your system two to system one stage. System one being when square through triggers this, okay, I know how to do this. I recognize this pattern. I know where I am, and all I have to do is do this. Yeah. Okay. How do we get there? We teach them properly. We're very careful about the framework that we're setting. Then they get regular practice until they begin to dance it as a chunk. And we don't want them to chunk together lead right and circle to a line. We don't want that to be one chunk in their memory. We want it to be two pieces that they know might not always be one after the other. Um, use appropriate timing. Yes, we. If once they get into wind in the face dancing, we're giving the next call as they're finishing the last one. That's okay, but you don't want to be giving them the next call when there's still two parts to be done to the last one and they might not do the last part because they start on the next call. So that's your timing that's important there. Clear and concise calls so they don't have to struggle to understand what it is you want them to do. Intermix difficult calls with easier ones to avoid memory overload. Use short sequences. Aim for smooth flow. Help with focus when it changes from waves to boxes. Minimize time in odd formations like half sachet and give clues to help them sort it out. Okay, I have not much time, but I think I have enough. Can I get a square up here on the floor? Looks like it. <laughs> Unless I dance, that's okay. <laughs> I'll stick over here. Okay, so although I would normally teach with music, stopping when I'm doing the very beginning walkthrough, but then mostly having music, as Jerry was already talking about, because I am also going to be adding in comments about the teaching process, I'm going to let that music matter set on the side. So we're going to start with this global description. We're going to workshop cast off three quarters. When two dancers cast off three quarters, they maintain their mini wave or their couple formation and use a common pivot point to turn three quarters around. So here we go. Heads past the ocean. They extend. All right. In the back of the mind, you're thinking, I have the heads facing out. Because we want to remember that we are going to want to have sides facing out at some point here to give everybody a fair chance. So here we go. We've got right hand holds. And what did we say? We're going to hold on to that mini wave. The pivot point is the hand holds. Okay. To cast off three quarters, you will maintain them and walk forward in a three quarter turn. Now, three quarters is a challenging thing. So. One way to deal with three quarters is to count walls. So look at the one you're looking at now. That's like the zero wall. Pivot on the handhold, one wall, keep going. Second wall, keep going. Third wall, and that's your three quarter point. So what am I doing there in terms of visual and auditory learners? I'm giving the visual learners a sense of, okay, I can do walls to count the three quarters. Right. Okay. Boys, run around the girls. Past the ocean. Who's facing out? Sides. Sides are now facing out. So we're now we're giving everybody a chance to do both parts. Again, your pivot point is your right hand. Two steps per wall is what the normal timing would be. So here we go. Count three walls. Go first wall, second wall, third wall. Good. Boys, you are facing out. Should be facing out. Girls facing in. Boys, run around the girl. Now I want to get them home relatively quickly. The end, star through. The center four, box the mat. And do a right and left through. 
in your home. Yeah, he's a girl. <laughs> he's a girl. <laughs> All right, now on the paper I have a singing call that matches the same kind of choreography that I just did. You can use that if you want. Here's second sequence. Sides past the ocean. Extend. Swing through. All right, so what have I done? I've changed this to having... Boys in the middle instead of girls in the middle. Now, if I knew that I had a kinesthetic learner on the floor, I might not do this quite so quickly. But I'm letting you see that this is the next step, if we're ready for this as the next step. Cast off three quarters, first wall, second wall, third wall. You should be... Um, you, you should end facing side walls with the boys facing in, sorry. Girls run around the boys. Box the net. Pass the ocean. Swing through. Now, I know that three-quarter turns are difficult, so here's another possibility. If walls is not the final solution for you, another way to do this is to think, and this works for me, I'm going to go where the person I'm holding right hands with in this point, the person that I'm working with, is... And then we're going to turn another quarter. So the, the halfway point, the trade point, is halfway around, and then we need another quarter. So cast off three quarters. Go over there, and then turn another quarter. Good. All right. Girls run around the boys. Center four to a right and left through while the others face in. Yes, you're there. Yep. Okay. Head couples lead to the right. And circle to a line. <laughs> All right. Pass through. All right. So now we've changed. And again, you have to judge your group and how quickly you want to progress from one stage to the next stage. And I'm not saying that you do it one right after another. But this is the next stage when you're ready to go there. So now you and your partner are facing in the same direction. So back to that global picture here, which was use a common pivot point to turn three quarters around. And now we have to decide which way we're going. And the rule is always turn away from the center of the line. So in this case, the centers are walking forward around their near end, three-quarter turn. Okay, here we go. Count the walls. Go one, two, three. And we have lines facing in again. Right and left through, pass through, and I'm going to do it again from the other direction. So we were facing sides and went to heads. Now we're doing heads and facing sides. Cast off three quarters, go one, centers around the ends, all the way, right and left through. And then everybody circle left a step or two and you're back home again. All right, side couples, star through. Double pass through. Now, in this case, because you're probably teaching cast off three quarters, soon after you've done centers in, it's relevant to be combining the two reasonably soon as we go along here. So we're going to combine them and put centers in. And notice that the body flow is quite nice here because the centers are now already in motion, and it's easy to continue to go around to do your cast off. So cast off three quarters. Yeah, right, good. Forward and back. And I'd point out that you should be S and D. Don't get uncomfortable. It's boy, boy, girl, girl. We're good because this is an uncomfortable position for many dancers at this stage in their lives. Star through. Double pass through. We're going again. Put centers in. Cast off three quarters. Lines go forward and back. Just the end dancers star through. And you should be home. And I think we're just about out of time. Thank you, dancers. Thank you very much. A nice hand for Dottie. Uh, just a, a few uh, wrap-up notes. We're just about. We have about a minute. So, um, uh, I noted when you did the demo with the 
square that you um, gave the name and then you read the definition. Do you do that when you teach? Okay. Dottie does that. I don't. Uh, there are some calls that I will give the definition or that I will give the um, I give the name. I very rarely, if ever, I don't ever recall actually reading the actual definition. That was, a, that was abbreviated. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, and that's, uh, right, right. <laughs> so, um, and, and Barry talked about that this, this morning about giving the name and then, and then building on that. Um, there are some calls that I do that um, most calls I don't. I, I establish a traffic pattern and then um, provide the name. And, of course, that drives the angels nuts because they say, oh, that's what that is. I have no idea what you're doing. Um, but that brings to the point of uh, the chunking where uh, uh, dancers learn these moves. All of the different parts of the move become one thing so that eventually when they hear right and left through, they don't think right pull by, courtesy turn. They think right and left through. It's one chunk of information. And um, uh, it's been my experience and prob probably yours too where a dancer will come up to you and say, you know that call where, you know, you, you turn by this hand and then these people turn and, and you say, swing through? No, no, that's not it. Uh, right and left through? No, that's not it. Spin the top? Yeah, that's it. Because to them, it's one chunk of information. They don't, they don't, they, they, they don't separate out the individual pieces. Which, and I tell them, that's exactly how it should be. You should know this as one chunk of information. Um, and as a final word, um, uh, I believe that it is important to uh, have a sequence of how you present moves. And my sequence... Uh, is I teach uh, a call. The next week, I reteach that call as if I had never taught it before. The next week, I review that call with, and each time, just a few less words. The next week, I drill that call with even less words. And by the fifth night, we dance it, and I try not to provide them any helping words at all. And if they, if they dance through, that's good. If they still need no, more help, then I will uh, provide that. Um, and uh, go, go what notification? <laughs> go what not notification? Half and a quarter. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> I wrote a note. I have no idea what it means. Um, but I think the, the – I don't think I know. The bottom line is – be, uh, preparation, Dottie's gone through uh, all of that, uh, as I've, have I. Be prepared. Use the resources that are available. Teaching tips uh, were gathered at the call up uh, conventions. Read those. Add to the things that you uh, use if they're important. Use checklists. They're on the, the website. The lists, the definitions teaching tips, all of this resources on the Call Lab website. I would encourage you to do that. Again, a real nice hand for Dottie. We want to uh, thank you very much for being at the convention and for attending this uh, session. We hope that you uh, got as much out of it as we did. Thank you very much.